One of the big unsolved mysteries in astronomy is where did Earth get all of its organic molecules, all of its volatile elements? We know that we have it today, but Earth is actually so close to the Sun that in the early days, when the Earth was just this ball of molten rock, then all of the volatiles, all of the water, all of the interesting nitrogen gases, things like that would have boiled off and been blown away off into space. And yet, clearly we have these things here on the planet. Where did they come from? But more importantly, where did the building blocks of life come from? The more complicated organic molecules. We know they form out in space. We see them in nebulae. We see them on the surface of asteroid samples. And yet, when you think about the kinds of ways that things could have arrived on Earth after the Sun had chilled out a bit, after the Earth had developed a magnetic sphere that could protect the planet, what kind of process could have delivered some of these elements to Earth? My guest today is Dr. Richard Anslow. He is a professor at the University of Cambridge, and he has done the math for the ways that comets could have gently delivered organic molecules to Earth in our early history. All right, here's the interview with Dr. Richard Anslow. This idea that the Earth had a hard time getting its water and various organic chemicals it has been a big mystery in astronomy. And yet, when you talk to people, they don't seem that surprised. Like, of course, there's going to be water and organic molecules in the solar system. Why is this such a mystery? Why is it such a mystery? So there's the solar system we look at today is, is very different to what was going on sort of soon after the sun formed and when we had the early stages of planet formation. And if we think about the early Earth, for example, at very early times, it was a very different, a very different planet. It was, the temperatures were really high. We have all this heat still being released from the processes of planet formation. And sort of as part of this, a lot of this initial volatile budget is outgassed from the planet and it leaves us with a very sort of quite inhospitable starting point. And then what happens as the Earth cools down and it interacts with remnant sort of objects left over from planet formation um, can then really shape the kind of chemicals we have on the Earth, what sort of concentrations, these are all in relative to each other. And this can be quite different to the initial um, building blocks of the sort of the Earth um, because of these planet formation processes, because of the initial radiation from the sun, because of all of these different factors can I mean the Earth today is a very different place to how it started. And so did it probably start with the same kinds of raw materials that that we have today, but just the processes outgassed it, the solar wind picked up the hydrogen, carried it away, like all of the, the radiation from the sun. So whatever it started with, it was it was a reset after sort of the first few hundred million years after the formation. Yeah, and there's even events like the moon forming impact will have really changed the sort of volatile inventory and the surface conditions of the earth even at sort of these very end stages of planet formation and in many ways you, you can always think about the moon forming impact as sort of resetting this stage and then after that we have had this sort of final um, sort of veneer of impacts delivered to the earth which has sort of shaped the initial sort of molecular budget that went into sort of the initial sort of stages of um, prebiotic chemistry and to sort of the development of life at that point. It's interesting. It's like the earth formed, it had its inventory of original material, lost whatever it needed, and then it got hit, got mixed up and like another chance to lose even more material in that following strike and whatever happened during that late heavy bombardment period. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of the details about that period just after the moon formation, sort of like the late heavy bombardment, you say, is is really hard to sort of directly understand. And we rely on things like the the impact craters on the moon to understand how many craters we have of a different age and try and tie that back to some idea of the impact flux and 
um, sort of the timeline of this bombardment. And there's lots of difficulties in doing these measurements. So whether there was this bombardment or whether this was sort of just some decaying sort of end tail of accretion is is difficult to tell. But but what does seem clear is that there was this initial period when the Earth was being hit by lots of different impactors with different compositions and from different places that all combined together to sort of deliver these final sort of volatiles. And so based on that challenge, that that paradox, what were the traditional ideas on how we got the water? Where did we get the organic chemistry from? Yeah. So I'll start with the, the chemistry side of things. And this was often sort of split into two tranches. So either it was um, synthesized on the earth. Some people call this endogenous synthesis. And there are lots of different ideas about how this could happen. Um, and this could be via lightning discharges interacting with the atmosphere to, to produce sort of carbon and nitrogen rich molecules, or it could be um, cosmic rays and this proton sort of bombardment. And even large impacts heating the atmosphere and sort of driving lots of this chemistry in the in the plumes behind the impact and a lot of this a lot of these ideas are really good at producing um the different building blocks but a lot of them depend on the atmospheric composition at the time so depending on what you have in the atmosphere can significantly change what types of molecules you can produce how efficiently you can do it um, and so that's that's sort of one sort of unknown slightly in those scenarios. And then I guess the other tranche would be the delivery of these. And so there's lots of different sort of classifications of these objects. So we, you could have dust, um, interplanetary dust, which will probably be hitting the earth in sort of high concentrations. Um, and we can think of this dust being produced by sort of the collisions of um, larger objects and asteroids, for example. And then you could think about meteorites and so asteroids impacting the Earth and these. We see with these return missions that you mentioned earlier that we see some sort of interesting chemistry going on on their surfaces. And then there's comets as well. And this is obviously something we'll come on to later that, that I thought about. Um, and these are maybe interesting because comets are really volatile rich in comparison to some of these other impactors. And I think one of the the benefits um, some people sort of think um, of sort of related to delivery is that it is much less dependent on the atmospheric composition of the Earth at the time. So if you manage to get these molecules from, from an object, from a comet or an asteroid to the surface and keep them intact, then then that's great. We don't need to worry too much about the atmosphere in that scenario. So, I mean, I think about all of these possibilities, and, you, and you, as you said, we actually talked about this before we started recording. So, um, but the but yeah, that we are now sort of post Osiris Rex has delivered its sample capsule back to Earth, and we've only got sort of initial analysis of what was inside that. But we've had the Hayabusa two mission has returned its information from from space and for more than a year now. And so we've got a lot of really interesting discoveries that have been made. And and it just seems to be more and more like amino acids are being found, more and more volatiles. Like they are, there is much more going on in these asteroids than we ever thought. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. And I, and I think there's this picture that's sort of building up that there's some really interesting chemistry going on in the solar system, in these colder regions of the solar system even on the surfaces of these asteroids. And, and sort of, as you mentioned, yeah, we're seeing amino acids, we're seeing some quite complicated sort of uh, carbonaceous and nitrogen bearing molecules found on um, these asteroids. And also there's, there's the Rosetta mission to, to a comet and that, and that found sort of a similar picture with lots of these carbon and nitrogen rich molecules, which is sort of painted this picture that there is this complexity that's that is out there in the outer solar system, which is all very relevant to these sort of discussions. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So uh, 
you know, the Earth lost its volatiles early on, and some mechanism probably brought them back. We've looked at asteroids, and the raw materials are there on the asteroids. You, in a recent paper, are favoring comets as a way to do this process. So what are you sort of, what are you proposing? Yeah, so I, in this recent work, I, I wouldn't say we were sort of necessarily favoring comets, but we were um, thinking that it is definitely a promising sort of um, thing to look at. And we were wanting to think about the consequences of cometary delivery and how this could be applicable to extrasolar planets as well as the Earth, because there's been some work um, thinking about the delivery to the Earth and suggesting that it could be a plausible scenario in sort of local environments following the impacts. And so we then wanted to say, okay, we look at the current population of exoplanets and there's all sorts of weird and wonderful planets out there. How do the properties of these planets, the properties of the stars and their environment, so their solar planetary systems um, affect uh, the dynamics of cometary delivery? Right. And I mean, the the way it was described in the research is that you've got comets skipping off world. So um, give me sort of a sense of what you think is going on here. Yeah. So to sort of paint the paint the picture um, in the solar system, at least we see uh, lots of comets in the Kuiper belt. So this is sort of a distant region of the solar system, which is predominantly ice, icy, sort of volatile rich bodies which are formed at lower temperatures at early times. And for these comets to reach the Earth or let's say another planet in the habitable zone, they need to go a long way from these outer icy rich regions into the inner parts of the planetary system. And so we thought, okay, what possible mechanisms could there be to slow these comets down? And and the idea we had was if there are a number of planets spaced between the habitable zone and the snow line, then each of these planets has the sort of possibility, at least, of interacting with this comet and modifying the comet's orbits and sort of sequentially passing the comet between planets from the outer regions of the planetary system towards the habitable zone. And if you if you can make this happen, then each of the uh, kicks the planet needs to give the comet to move it one step further inwards can happen at lower velocities. And so that that that's the overall idea. And the velocity is the problem. The vo- like if you get a comet coming from say the Oort cloud and it's coming straight in, not making any stops, and just smashes into the Earth, that is not good for the organic molecules that it was carrying on board. Absolutely, yeah. So these comets are often very big and very, very fast. And so these have a huge amount of kinetic energy when they're arriving at a planet. And that has to go somewhere. And a lot of that goes into heating up heating up the comet upon impact. And these impacts are very short because of the velocities involved, but the temperatures and pressures reached are really high. And so these can be temperatures of tens of thousands of degrees. Um, and maybe even up to hundreds of gigapascals in terms of the pressure. And so those conditions are really difficult for um, very many molecules to survive at all. The more complex the molecule, the much easier it is at these energies to break it down. I'm kind of imagining dropping Lego sets. I've, you know, built a bunch of really nice Lego sets and I'm dropping them off my building and they're <laughs> smashing beside you. Yeah. <laughs> and and we lose the that it's a, you know, a head of Darth Vader and we lose that it is a um, you know, a firehouse and now it's just a bunch of pieces again. The comet is going to deliver the carbon and the oxygen, but you're not going to get the amino acids, you're going to get the smashed up parts. And and so then what kind of velocity is the comet going to need to impact that actually it is able to preserve the these molecules? Yeah, I, yeah, I like I like the analogy of breaking up these these bigger bigger pieces. And yeah, um, so this velocity changes molecule by molecule as 
you can imagine the larger the molecule, the, the lower the velocity you need to break it down. Um, there's some great work done uh, a few years ago now by um, Zoe Todd and Karen Oberg who looked at um, hydrogen cyanide during these impacts. And this is a, a small molecule. So this is made of hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen. And so it's, it's, it's really simple and has a strong um, triple bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. And so this is a pretty sort of robust molecule. And they found that to have delivery with sort of reasonable sort of hydrogen cyanide survival impacts below 15 kilometers a second are probably ideal. You, you can get away with a bit higher, but it, it decreases very quickly um, with, with velocity. And, w- and what are our, our Oort cloud objects smashing into the earth at? Um, an Oort cloud object could be at velocities of maybe 50 kilometers a second. They're, right. going, to be, okay. they're going to be really high because they right, are coming right. from hugely um, distant regions of the planetary system. And the, the, the orbit the comet would require would have a very, very high eccentricity. And that, that leads to these really, really large um, velocities. So I've kind of got two thoughts playing in my mind right now. Like on the one hand, it feels like it's a lot of complicated three body interactions to get an object into this pipeline that is where it's going to finally reach the point that it has a fairly low velocity compared to us when it actually does smash into us. But on the other hand, I think about near earth asteroids and there is this process where Jupiter is just shoving all of these asteroids into into orbits that bring them into close proximity of the Earth. In fact, you know, it's it's all Jupiter's fault. They're all if you listen, <laughs> Jupiter is protecting us. Well Jupiter is also throwing, you know, constantly shoving all these asteroids into orbits that bring them really close to us. And so are you imagining sort of like an individual like three body interaction with, with, with an object that, you know, and then you've got a lot of time on your hands, or is it just like there is this pipeline, like a conveyor belt of Kuiper belt objects or centaurs or something that are moving through this process? Yeah. The, the, you were, you were right to think about these sort of three body interactions. And so, so that, that was how we did the actual modeling. And so we thought that as, as the comet moves in, it, when it reaches each planet, it has a chance of having a three-body interaction. And there's there's a few different outcomes that could happen at that point. It could be accreted by the planet, it could be ejected back out of the planetary system, or it could be um, scattered further in, um, which is what we want for this scenario to work. And so you're right that it, it isn't a particularly common um, scenario because there's, a, there's quite a small probability that a comet will encounter some of these intermediate planets on the way in. Um, but a lot of the literature sort of can work or is suggested to work with maybe one or a few of these impacts rather than needing necessarily lots and lots of these low velocity impacts. Huh. Um, so just a, so just a few the of these impacts over the course of billions of years would be enough delivery of material like what did you estimate uh so we didn't do any chemical modeling just to sort of be upfront about that but there has been previous work to think about what happens if we have one of these low velocity impacts and can we concentrate hydrogen cyanide in particular to um sort of create some of the important building blocks of life and kind of kind of create these sort of simple polymers and get started down these chemical chemical networks and the the great thing about these low velocity impacts if we can deliver enough hydrogen cyanide is that the concentrations are high enough that this seems to be possible in in local environments so if you almost think about um, this happening in a pond or the crater the crater produced by the impact that that's sort of the, the the general picture of how it might might be seen to work, because oh sorry yeah, I was just going to say because if we're thinking of 
cometary impacts into the ocean uh, delivering these molecules it's <laughs> it's just going to be a drop in the ocean <laughs> if you pardon the pun but it's difficult to concentrate these um prebiotic building blocks to sufficient quantities for this prebiotic chemistry to to be efficient and potentially to work and, and so are you sort of separating things like on the one hand you've got the comets that are coming in faster that are delivering the water and you don't really care you know back to the lego analogy it doesn't matter if they all break up i'm just pouring the big bucket of lego on you and you've got all the lego you need mm-hmm. but but with these very fragile molecules you only need a few to get the the raw material started like like i can feed my a tree a whole bunch of of just chemicals and and that it can use that the bacteria underneath can use it to to supply the tree with nutrients so is it like you know it's just like the i'm trying to think of another analogy i'm sorry i'm, I'm analogizing today <laughs> it's like a sourdough starter right yes. it's like yeah right right okay yeah that, that's that's the right idea so the idea is that if we can have a low enough velocity impact we could have enough stuff just contained within that impact to to get us started and for this prebiotic chemistry to sort of get going from that point. Now, now, you know, you talked about like, well, you know, maybe there's some kind of lightning strike or maybe there's some kind of interesting chemistry or something happening at the deep sea vents. Why do we like the formation of these organic molecules off of the earth? Like why is that a more interesting, I don't know, more, more interesting place, a more, um, that seems more reasonable as a place where some of this stuff might get built up as opposed to by a deep sea vent or whatever. Like what's the advantage? So I think the arguments in favor of delivery in these local environments is that if we can keep all of these reactants in this, in this pond, let's say, and we can have it starting at a high concentration and, and we, and we know what's there. And if we don't have, a huge amount of water, for example, these ponds can respond to the climate and they can, they can dry out and they can, they can replenish and they go through these cycles of becoming wetter and drier. And some work suggests that this is a really efficient process of um, driving some of this chemistry, producing polymers and um, concentrating salts on the edges of the ponds. And there's lots of, lots of different ideas like this which seems to work quite nicely in in these local environments. So I think that's that's an advantage. Um, I think a sort of a, a challenge with the scenario is making sure these molecules can actually survive in the first place. Because if they can't survive, then then it, then it's not much use. And I think some of these other mechanisms that generate hydrogen cyanide in lightning or in impacts. Um, I think they can, it looks like they can produce more hydrogen cyanide. And I guess the challenge in those scenarios is concentrating it into local environments. And so I, I'm not a chemist, so I'm not necessarily saying this way is better than that way or, or, or whatever, but, but they're the main ideas, I think, sort of in favor of the different scenarios. But I think if you were like, say we were 50 years ago, and someone was saying, oh, you know, like we knew we, we saw hydrogen cyanide, I know that sort of caused a great fear 120 years ago when a comet was coming close to earth but but thinking about the kinds of elements like like i know astronomers are always surprised They're like we found these 80 amino acids in space right like i think astronomers keep being continuously surprised at the complexity and the size of the organic chemistry that's going on out in space itself is there something special about these like i don't know zero gravity environments cold environments far away from the sun like is there something that is turning them into organic molecule factories that's different than planet earth i think one of the the big differences is is the temperature where this is all happening and so i don't think the usual kinetic um picture of chemical reactions is applicable on comets compared to what we're familiar with on the earth. And I think this can have the benefit of producing some of these more 
um, volatile molecules where I think it's driven by radical chemistry. And I might be corrected by astrochemists uh, after this, but I think that's the general picture that if we have these lower temperatures, we can have different chemical pathways favored. And that could be um, helping to generate these uh, complicated um, molecules in these distant regions. Um, th there was a this work that was done by a bunch of researchers. I read it a couple of years ago, and they were sort of calculating how often comets might actually pass through the atmosphere of the Earth of varying sizes. And they, they found that it's every few hundred thousand years, you should get a comet that comes so close that it actually passes right through the atmosphere of the Earth and picks up molecules as it goes. And over long periods of time, a lot of really weird stuff could theoretically happen. And so if you think about sort of these kind of gradual, you know, literally bouncing off from world to world, do you sort of see that as a pathway maybe for like panspermia, things like that? I've, I've never read that paper, actually. It's an interesting idea. And I think you will need very specific uh, sort of impact parameters for that to happen. I guess it would have to be a very grazing sort of angle. Um, and so I guess the question would be how often these impacts happen. Yeah, they said every few um, hundred thousand years that some object, and it wouldn't be like a big cataclysmical, it could be something that's just a few hundred meters across, right? That would be grazing close enough that it actually passed through the upper layers of the atmosphere and went out. I, I can send you a link to the paper afterwards. It was a, it was yeah, a heavy lobe great. and one of his researchers' papers, they did the math a couple of years ago. Oh, interesting. Okay. I yeah. think there's there's lots of interesting dynamics with, with small bodies um, within between the terrestrial planets even. And I think we can see that there's me meteorites from Venus, from Mars. And these these objects, when they're kicked off planets, can, can move around. So there definitely is some level of interaction um, between all the terrestrial planets. And I think this will probably be even more accentuated in in different planetary systems we see, which are really tightly packed together. Where, oh, that's really interesting. Okay, yeah. Where there's going to be more planets within sort of a similar within a similar region. And so this this changes the picture of all the dynamics of these these bodies and, and what's going on in these systems. Would more planets make it better or worse? Uh, I think that there was a paper that was looking um, into panspermia in the TRAPPIST-1 system, for example. And I think the, the idea there was because the TRAPPIST-1 system planets are much closer to the star, the time scales of their orbits is much smaller. And so it's much quicker to redistribute matter between the planets and there's a i think there might be a higher chance of intercepting it just because they're more tightly packed together as well but it's an interesting idea like there's this you know this idea of like comparative geology or like think about things in situ that you you find a rock and then you pick up the rock and then you notice the cliff above you and that gives you a sense of of where that rock came from and and that's part of being a geologist and and sort of when you think about this that in fact the environment the planetary system could lead towards more habitable planets purely by how much these gravitational interactions are driving more of these comets into these slower orbits and, and improving the amount of organic material that's arriving on the planet. Um, like I know that, for example, on Earth, we're starved for phosphorus. And so we didn't get enough cometary deliveries of, of phosphorus early on, and now we're stuck with this very phosphorus poor planet, but maybe there's another star system out there that is, you know, that has the right dynamics. And so just getting regular deliveries just in time of everything that is needed. And you can have a more habitable biosphere just because this process carried on longer or it was more gentle or anything, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. That it's really important to look at the whole environment a planet's in to understand its history and what it's had to sort of go through, what it's been made of, what's happened to it. And you mentioned earlier that Jupiter is sort of playing a, a two, two-fold sort of role um, for the Earth. And in some sense, it's, it's protecting the interplanetary system, but also it's, um, it's sort of moving some asteroids onto planet-crossing orbits as well. And so, so understanding if there are giant planets, if there are planets nearby, 
how big these debris belts of comets and asteroids are, how much stuff is there in the planetary system. All of these factors are going to have big effects on on what a on the sort of formation pathway and history of a planet. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I also kind of wonder about like places like out at Jupiter, where you've got the icy moons around Jupiter. You know, could Jupiter's gravity and its ability to grab things through these three body interactions contribute to the iciness of the moons, or maybe the 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 amount of organic molecules that are on them? That maybe we have a miniature version of this when say the Europa Clipper goes or when juice arrives, then maybe you can actually get a better sense of like, did Jupiter help bring in and slow down comets that it was passing close by? Cause we see it's Trojan belts, like they're filled with material. Yeah, so about clearly to it mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, sorry. Yeah. And the, the, the icy moons are, are sort of a fascinating sort of test test bed for all of these ideas and understanding the, the formation history of, the whole planetary um, system sort of full stop, what things were made out of, what time did these different processes happen and how this all sort of plays together to, to, to lead to what we have um, today. What, I mean, this, this is tough because we need a time machine, but, <laughs> but what, I guess, observation or discovery or experiment would you love to do to give you a better sense if, if you're on the right track? I think a lot of the observations happening with the James Webb Space Telescope at the minute are, are really fascinating. And I think one particular type of systems, sort of these multi-planet systems, are going to be really interesting to, to understand how the um, environmental context of a planet affects um, its um, composition and its habitability. And, and these are really nice because we know they're all orbiting the same star, so they've all been subject to the same, same processes, the same history, but scaled by their distance. And so if we compare the atmosphere of planet to planet in these systems, then we can start to try and understand some of these other processes that are going on, which is more difficult to do comparing planets around different stars to planets around different stars, because there's this extra degree of freedom involved in the, in the problem. I mean, there are some observations by Webb already that are kind of related. One that just came out last week where astronomers could see ice covered dust moving inward in a planetary disk and so they could actually see but that's that first round right not the second round i think you know this is like a star system that's only a hundred thousand years old so so it's the mm. first delivery for the planets actually get made but also delivering the the water but it's the you know it's the buckets of lego not the not the the made up sets um and then yeah. the um and then also but we've seen examples of like cometary disks exploded planets, things like that in other star <laughs> systems. And, and so you can see it's still a very dynamic place out there in these other star systems. Um, Richard, what are you obsessed with right now? I am, what I'm thinking about all the time is how the uh, architecture affects the dynamics of comets and how the comets actually interact with the planet, how they impact, where they impact, how, how do these overlap? Are there connections between where we have impacts and when they happen? And how does this all build into this picture of building complexity on, on planets and trying to sort of put together sort of an overall picture of where are things coming from? How much are they bringing? What can they bring? And what order is this all happening? Can we, can we put together some some sort of timeline of when different things are possible and how the planet and its surroundings all play into this. And, and how do you think about getting answers to that question? Is it, is it observed, you know, time on web? Is it, um, or is it, you know, computer simulations? So a lot, I've not done any observations myself uh, so far. I think this is sort of a really exciting time. So, I think it's something I definitely want to be thinking about sort of moving forwards for sure. And 
so I've, I've been doing a lot of simulations and working with people who are doing even bigger simulations. Um, so there's some people in the group that are doing sort of 3D simulations of these cometary impacts to really work out what is the temperature profile of, of these comets and better constraining some of the numbers we need to put into all of these, all of these systems. And in terms of how I do it, I, I think, okay, what are these, what are the cool types of systems out there? Something I was interested in recently were so-called peas in a pod systems, which we see uh, quite regularly around low mass stars. And this I, sort of I haven't heard that term before. Yeah, so they're really cool, and it describes this phenomenon where if we see these systems of multiple planets around low-mass stars, we regularly see that the planets around a single star tend to all be a very similar size, and they all tend to be very regularly spaced. And so we can picture, okay, maybe there's four or five planets that are all almost the same size, and they're all a specific ratio um, apart in terms of their orbital period. And this is really weird compared to sort of the overall exoplanet populations we see, because we see we see sort of mini Neptunes, super Earths, Jupiters, terrestrial planets. And so then to see these systems with everything looking so similar is 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 quite quite surprising. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, when when will we have a telescope capable of seeing exocomets? That's the big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that'd be okay. very cool. And, yeah, and, I sure. just, and, and people are very interested in exomoons as well and trying to yeah. detect. Detect yeah, I was, well. I was, I was wondering about that. I mean, I know people are trying to detect exomoons, but you know, it's sort of back related to that question about Jupiter. That that if you had a terrestrial planet in orbit around some giant planet that was a three body plot, you know, three body interaction factory, would that make for a more habitable world? Like, do would these indoor worlds actually be the best places to look if they're going to have all this delivery of of gentle organic material? I think that would really depend on how close the 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 moon or the planet would be to the to the giant planet because an important velocity scale is the escape velocity. And so if you're too close to Jupiter, all the comets arriving at your surface are going to have been accelerated uh, to very high velocities by Jupiter before this point. So I think there's a there's probably going to be a trade-off I think between Having but you don't want to be in the magnetosphere flux. anyway. Oh, so, sorry, say that again. You don't want to be in the magnetosphere anyway. Like you want to be far away from your giant planet for both yes. to not be, mm -hmm. you know, passing through the, the trapped radiation, but also so that you're not getting the accelerated comets, you're getting the slowed down comets. So I'm sure the exo community, exo moon community would love to to hear, you know, which are the most habitable exo moons to, to go hunting for. That's interesting. Yeah, definitely. And there's been there's been lots of uh, interesting work done for, for some time now thinking about the impact velocities onto these moons and how often an asteroid or a comet coming at the whole system will hit the moon compared to the planet. And all of these are important factors to consider when understanding how we go from what's hitting Jupiter to, to what's hitting a moon or something like that. Is, is there a way to sort of see some of these slow impacts on the moon? I, because I'm assuming the in terms of is, the crater you know, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you would find the right kind of crater that is that is not a high impact crater. I think a difficulty with um, the crater record is there is you can make a large crater with a small body going very fast or a large body going slower. Right. And so, so working out exactly what combination of size and and velocity has challenges right it's a one half mv squared problem yes yeah right yeah yeah that's okay. essentially it mm -hmm. well richard absolutely fascinating thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today i really appreciate it and uh, and good luck in in finding the comet that delivered uh, life to earth <laughs> thank you thanks for having me all right bye, bye i hope you enjoyed that interview i'm going to talk about this idea a little bit more but first i'd like to thank our patrons Thanks to Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, 
David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Chilipin, Modso, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Matter, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I know people think it's really simple. Like, of course, if there was water, there was organic molecules in the solar system, then that's where the Earth got them. And yet that early Earth was such an awful place that it really was hostile to the kinds of raw material that we really take for granted here on Earth, and that there had to be a more complicated process. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is that James Webb is actually doing a lot of work that is revealing how this works kind of in real time we're seeing news stories come out and so like a big one that came out this week that i mentioned briefly in the interview was that webb saw icy particles being delivered to the inner solar system of some other protoplanetary system and so we can actually see one of these theories on how this material got delivered just sort of working in real time and then the other thing that's really interesting is the samples. I mean, we have samples from OSIRIS-REx. We have samples from Hayabusa 2. And these two missions are showing that the kinds of organic molecules, the building blocks of life, are there in the solar system, just need to figure out a mechanism to get there. So hopefully this is the one that helps explain that. But it is really kind of amazing that we are at this time when this really important question, there are the tools to answer it. And that's really exciting. Now, obviously, I've done a ton of interviews on this subject. So one that I think is really interesting is the possibility of being able to detect an Earth-like planet with a protective magnetosphere by the interaction of the magnetosphere with solar flares coming from the sun, that just by seeing auroras on an exoplanet, we discover both that there is a planet there, but also that it has a protective magnetosphere. Fascinating interview. And then the other one that you might want to look at is the process of directly imaging exoplanets, which is something that we're going to want to be able to do in the future to see these planets newly forming in other star systems and maybe even detect the chemicals as they exist at different times in a planet's history. All right, we'll see you next time.